Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Rick to the Com video, we're going to be tackling and analysing tech news which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. This video is going to focus on two pieces of news. The first is an AMD fix for the adrenaline driver game compatibility issues, which were plaguing certain DirectX 9 titles, and then we're going to move swiftly onto the Intel CPU bug because there have been several updates on this as well as some more benchmarks which have actually been released. And these benchmarks actually paint an even more grim picture than what we had originally anticipated. But we'll get into that in a second because this piece of news is gonna be much faster. So, as we ended 2017, there was a piece of news going around that AMD's Adrenaline Driver had incompatibilities with certain older DirectX 9 titles. These included, but not limited to, certain Command & Conquer games, um, Battle for Middle Earth 1 and 2, and perhaps most crucial of all, The Witcher Enhanced Edition. Now, at the time, AMD made a statement on their own forums which said that they were unlikely to devote any valuable engineering resources to fix this. Can you guess what happened, everyone? That's right, people were not impressed, and of course, the user backlash happened, and AMD have decided to release a fresh statement, and this one comes to us from Terry Makedon's Twitter. He says, This is not true. We will for sure fix this bug in that Sage Engine games in an upcoming hotfix. And then in a separate statement, Happy 2018, everyone. I am seeing some stories pop up about AMD not supporting old games. This is absolutely not true. We are identifying the bug and working on a fix as soon as possible. Command Conquer, Witcher, um, etc. will be working again. End quote. Two things. First of all, I'm applauding AMD for fixing this. This is great. You know, I 100% appreciate the fact that they are going ahead and addressing these issues because ultimately one of the benefits of PC gaming is backwards compatibility. To know that if you upgrade your graphics card, if you add in additional RAM, if you decide to update your processor, that type of thing, well, by golly gosh, you can still run the titles which you bought a couple of years back. However, I will say that his statement um, with the particular part I'm honing in on saying that this is absolutely not true, well, come on AMD, you said it yourselves, uh, officially, so of course websites are going to report that. So once again, while I am grateful that it is being fixed, would it be fixed if, of course, users had not um, complained an awful lot? Let's just be honest, and obviously uh, people actually writing stories about it. Who knows? So I did a story yesterday regarding the Intel kernel bug. And as of the time I'm recording this, there is still no official comment from Intel. To remind everyone what this essentially allows, it would allow a Ring 3 user to read data from Ring 0. In other words, it can allow a regular user to execute code which would then be able to read kernel data. And this is because of Intel's processor architecture, the speculative execution as long as you stop the code from running before the security check can be performed, and due to how operating systems function, specifically virtual memory, so when an application needs to do pretty much anything of use, for example, open a file, it needs to hand over control to the kernel. Then when the, when the kernel has finished its task, it will then hand the CPU control back over to the application. So in short, for efficiency's sake, the kernel will try to make a prediction of what code will be executed next, and then obviously it will have this data ready to be handed over. And so what we're hearing now about now is kernel page table isolation, also known as KPTI. The idea behind this is that the kernel is now completely blind to the system itself and will remove the virtual memory space until the system actually calls for that data. Now, according to what we're hearing, most likely the average user won't probably be affected too much. So, for example, if you're a gamer or perhaps you're just doing, you know, word processing or perhaps even like video editing, that type of stuff, then probably you're going to be OK when this patch is applied because you don't utilize heavy contents, uh, context, excuse me, switching. But... And also, you don't hammer I.O. like, for example, an enterprise client. But imagine you're someone like Google. Imagine you're someone like Amazon. Imagine you're like, say, Microsoft with their Azure platform. That, of course, is very different. Not only if the patch is applied, 
where you suffer from slowdown, which is a major problem from service level agreements. We'll get into that in a second. But if you don't apply the patch, potentially your customers could be wide open for major security vulnerabilities. Because think about it, technically, you and I could provision a virtual machine on a specific server. I could be a malicious user. I could run a piece of code, and then obviously I could snoop into the data that you're potentially running on your server. You may not like that much. Now there is a website which has actually started to do some testing on this. It is Foronix, that is P-H-O-R-O-N-I-X, and they have uh, managed to do some synthetic tests on this with IO benchmarks and other bits and pieces. Honestly, it's not good. Uh, for example, if we were to look at the FS Mark 3.3 with 5,000 files, one megabyte in size, four threads, well, if you look at the before and after, you're looking at 293.60, and then in the post, 135.20. That is devastating levels of performance loss right there. Absolutely devastating. The compile benchmark is pretty bad, but not as bad with, for example, 656.20 versus the post of 558.77. So yes, that's a loss, but not as terrible. Video encoding, for example, the X264, uh, that's the um, post, I'm sorry, the pre of 305.55 and post is 303.70, which is essentially within the margins of error. Obviously a little slower, but well within the margins of error. So obviously that performance loss is absolutely devastating. And from a server level, uh, so, sorry, service level agreement, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. I don't want to get too uh, deep into this because frankly, I'll probably eat up like two hours of video if I really had to explain all the facets of this. And also one of the reasons I'm skimming over some of the technical details, I'll provide links in the video description that can go more in depth into this if you're so desiring to read it. But from a service level agreement perspective, and a provisioning level perspective, let's say you're a server company, and let's say you've got 1,000 servers available, let's say you know, you've know you got 1,000 machines, and you anticipate that the average usage on those machines hits around the 60 to 70% mark. Now, obviously this is vastly simplifying things because we're not taking into account CPU for performance in isolation, GPU performance in isolation, IO performance in isolation, memory, and all of that, but still. And then these, fixes are applied, which obviously you need to do because you can't leave your system open for vulnerabilities sake. But now what happens to the provisioning and all this carefully monitored uh, stuff that you've been working on for years? Now, you know, potentially clients might have their services either drastically slowed down and you will no longer be able to guarantee the performance you once did, which means they are going to be buying for, buying for your blood, but also how are Intel going to remedy this? Don't forget, this is not something that you can fix with a BIOS update, at least from what we're understanding. Hopefully, Intel can fix it with a BIOS update, but it looks incredibly unlikely that they're able to fix it with a BIOS update. Therefore, if they're not, and once again, this goes back 10 years of architecture, I don't actually know what they can really do. I mean, I've been discussing this with a couple of system administrators and other people I know, and they're just like, I, I don't know what they can do. They either have to accept that performance is either going to be between zero, which is great for gamers, you know, spiffy for gamers, not so not so bad for video encoding, but for, once again, high-end uh, high usage scenarios, lots of virtual machines, or perhaps even high-end compute databases, that type of stuff, you're screwed, and I don't really know what Intel can do. And before AMD starts to jump and say, yay, hee hee, look at you, Intel. Well, there are also some problems from there because Intel uh, may be the ones who are vulnerable to this and AMD's processors are not vulnerable to this. But unfortunately, with the distributions of Linux, with the patches that have been released thus far, it looks like the machine runs these fixes on all the 86, x86 processors. So this is irrespective of whether it's an AMD processor or whether it's an Intel processor. I do feel, however, this is likely eventually going to be fixed. Essentially, what you need to do is put a flag that says if it is a specific x86 
processor. In other words, if the vendor is AMD, then you do not uh, enable this uh, this uh, patch because your CPU is secure, so you simply force it to not run. But once again, this is still pretty early on this. I'm probably going to uh, have to make a, a retraction on this tomorrow or perhaps in a couple of days. But as of the time I'm recording this, not all distributions have this running. Uh, and this is about 10 days ago. I'll once again place a link to this discussion on the description of this video. So you can go ahead and check it out. It's pretty lengthy, um, but it might be worth it if you are a system administrator. I'll also say that there's another interesting story that's kind of come to my attention um a friend of mine actually sent this to me uh, via whatsapp and um because he and i were talking about this and it's quite interesting because he's kind of done some investment and it did raise an eyebrow for him at the time but the ceo of intel has actually sold a whole a bunch of stock and in fact he's keeping now just the bare minimum number of shares and this, by the way, is public knowledge. You, I'm looking at it on The Motley Fool, which is a pretty nice website. And once again, he dumped uh, 2,400, um, excuse me, 245,743 shares. So this basically equates to about 11 million US dollars. And obviously some people were just saying, well, this is maybe for his personal reasons. Perhaps he's getting close to, to retirement. Perhaps he just wanted to buy a new house somewhere. Perhaps his wife's spotted you know a new car or something i don't know whatever but obviously this is probably you can speculate this of one of two ways back in the time that this article was published which was in december mid-december if memory serves they believed it was to increase market capitalization others are saying that it's possible that well he saw the writing on the rock on the wall and i did actually have a quick look at intel stock prices earlier let me just double check them again yeah ow. um when i looked earlier uh this was about i don't know i think it was about two maybe 2 p.m uk time 1 p.m uk time the price had actually gone down about two percent now it's almost 4.3 percent and going up and down all the time obviously as stocks do so intel are definitely being smacked so yeah i mean the fact of the matter is that intel are already getting hit in their shares and as i said performance looks like it's certainly being smacked at the moment the usual stuff you know just keep your eye out unfortunately we have to wait for intel to make an official statement and it looks like we're going to have to wait for the patches to really get an understanding of what happens in the real world. Obviously, these benchmarks are not exactly favorable for Intel. It's not like they've gone up 50%. So, you know, if in reality it only goes to like, you know, 20% improvement performance, you're not going to be upset. But regardless of whether these benchmarks are accurate or inaccurate, it's not like you're going to be seeing a positive uptake in performance for Intel. And obviously that's really bad news. And in the server market as well, where AMD are being very competitive with obviously the Epic range of processors, particularly when you take into account that Epic is a very good value proposition. I'm not saying that Intel are screwed by any stretch of the imagination. They obviously have A, the funds to go through this, and B, they have a reputation at least. So... I'm not saying that their reputation is going to be fully intact, but it certainly, it probably could survive, but it's not a good look. And I have a feeling that Intel are going to have to eat a lot of humble pie over the next several months to remedy this. And quite frankly, I'm going to be mighty curious to know how they're going to make all of this feel better. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.